So welcome. More people. Welcome, my name is, is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College and uh, thrilled to have you uh, joining us on this Friday near the end of July um, for the virtual reading group. Uh, we are reading, we're finishing uh, this book, uh, The Last Interviews, uh, which is uh, an extraordinary little book. Um, uh, came out a couple of years ago. Um, it doesn't say it in it, but I believe it was edited by Ursula Lutz and Thomas Wild. And um, uh, it's just four interviews that Arendt did near the ends of her life. Um, we've read through three of them, and I, I think they've been actually extremely exciting conversations, so I'm glad you're all here. Um, this last one uh, is an interview by Roger Herrera, who was done in New York, as he explains in the introduction. Uh, unlike some of the other ones, this is a heavily edited interview. Um, it was, I mean, out, out of many hours of, of, of questions and answers, um, Ursula, uh, I mean, uh, Roger Herrera and his team at the French TV picked, uh, picked some of it and turned it into um, uh, a French, TV show, which you can watch on YouTube if, if you're interested. I'm sure someone will put the link in 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 the chat. Um, and uh, and then they have Ursula has gone and through very painstaking attempts, recreated the original English through listening in the background to what Arendt is saying and other notes. And um, she and Tomas have have put it have edited it here. Um, uh, just before I, I begin, um, just first of all, a thank you to all those who've rejoined uh, for your memberships during our membership drive this week. And if you haven't, um, just a reminder, please do uh, rejoin. We, we love having you at the Virtual Reading Group. It's a privilege of membership, and uh, we just love you to be a member. So at any level you can, there's some great perks, and hope you'll rejoin. So... Um, this this interview uh, touches on uh, a number of important points. I'm not going to get to them all in my introduction. You guys can can bring them up, but I want to start off with um, maybe six that that I find um, particularly uh, meaningful and and relevant today. Um, it begins with a question, a very simple question that you know Hannah Arendt came to the United States in 1941. You'll recall she was a stateless person, had been stateless since she left Germany in 33, remained stateless uh, for 17 years uh, until about 1950. Um, and he asks her, what was her main impression of the United States? You know, and I could imagine this being asked to a lot of immigrants and no one would come up with the answer that uh, Arendt uh, chose to, to, to provide, which is that her first impression of the United States is that it's not a nation state. Um, it's not a nation, it's a country, uh, is, is her argument. Um, so what does she mean by this? Uh, she means that unlike Germany, which is a country of Germans in which there were also Jews, or France, in which a country of Frenchmen, in which there are also, you know, Jews and Arabs, and unlike uh, Italy, in which there's Italians, but also other people, Roma and others, um, the United States, she says, has no national identity. It wasn't ever imagined as, as a nation state. Um, what makes someone uh, a, a citizen of the United States um, is not a, na a nationality, uh, but consent to the Constitution. Um, this is a point Arendt makes many times um, in her writing uh, and, and, in, and in different interviews and talks. Um, I will say it's, it's a controversial point um, and, and one that I think um, bears us teasing apart and asking about. Um, you know, is the United States truly a, a country uh, in which um, as long as you consent to the Constitution, you are an American citizen? Um, 
Uh, clearly, this has not always been the case. Um, uh, and yet what Arendt, I think, is arguing is that this is the idea of America. And in her experience as a Jew, it was the reality of America when she arrived here in 1941. Um, I think uh, for many people, uh, there's a number of ways to critique her statement, one of which is that even though it may never have been a nation state, it was a white state, and that um, many of the different nationalities who uh, emigrated here um, became American by becoming white. And I think that is a, um, uh, an important, um, at least caution, if not criticism of, of her argument, one that she makes many times. It's not, uh, in my mind, it's not a, a destructive criticism because one can, of course, uh, change that by um, uh, making the constitution and the country um, be one in which it's not white. And I think there's an enormous effort that's been going on for many years to have that happen. Um, and, and, and I think one of the big debates around the question of whether um, America needs, the American constitution can be um, salvaged and, and modernized or whether it needs to be abolished as many people in the, in the sort of anti-credal American constitutional movement argue um, is one of the more important and pressing questions of our time. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, you know, uh, she, she does strongly believe that the constitution um, was, not a, was never intended to be a democracy. It was intended to be a weak executive with a strong legislative uh, branch. And that the point was to, have the, the, the overriding effort of the founders as she understands it was to avoid, um, uh, the, the country becoming a singular nation, right? That's what she thinks happened in France. So if we read On Revolution, her book On Revolution, the country imagined itself as one nation. Um, her, her point, and, and I'll get to this a little later, uh, is that the, the, the strength of America was its pluralism. The idea that the constitution was supposed to prevent any one group, any one power structure, any one institution, from becoming dominant. There was supposed to be no sovereignty in America uh, and thus no national unity. It was supposed to be a country that was designed to frustrate the attempts of any majority to legitimate itself as a majority. And that's what she found so fresh, original, and compelling about the American constitutional structure, a structure that she spent a lot of time criticizing as having failed as well. Um, but uh, at least she found the ideal of it um, deeply uh, compelling. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point I wanted to talk about, which she begins talking about on, on 115 forward, and this is a, a theme that's obviously gonna be near and dear to many of your hearts today, um, is the massive intrusion of criminality into the political process, right? Um, anyone who's lived through the last five years and um, certainly the last two, month or so of the, of the January 6th hearings has been witness to, um, uh, again, her point about this is, is much more nuanced than I, people, than I think is often understood. What she means by the massive intrusion of criminality is not, that people are criminals or that they're, you know, uh, uh, it's that they're out to do evil things. It's that people come to believe that they can do anything in the name of power and obtaining power, and there will be no consequences. A, because they are in power and they'll be able to control it, but B, because other people would do the same. And other people would understand that. And, and so when she talks about Watergate and she talks about the Vietnam War, what she says is the reason people in Nixon's administration were, were, were able and willing to go along with Nixon is not that they were criminals, but that they simply thought 
no one would care and everyone would do what they were doing. They were seeking um, power and that they had uh, seen that anything was okay, anything was legitimate in the pursuit of power. And that's what she calls the massive intrusion of criminality. So, I mean, I raised this as a question. We can come back to it in the q and I think this is an excellent, really excellent way of understanding what I came away with after watching these January 6th hearings over the last month, is that there was just a sense that people had, they knew they were doing something wrong. They tried to sort of legalize it, but they just figured no one would really care. Um, and they thought they could get away with it. Uh, they thought that at the end, and, and they may, you know, I mean, that's still, I think that's still um, out for, up for, up for debate, whether they will or not get away with it. Um, but that's what she uh, means by the massive intrusion of criminality, which she talks about on page 115 and forward. And the question that Roger Era asks is, is this, is this, is this you know, idea of, 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 of doing anything for the state proper to our time? Is it unique to our time? And she says, in some ways, it's an old idea, but what's new is this idea that the entire um, political system has become um, a criminal system. And what she means by that, and she says this clearly in her essay, Home to Roost, is not that they're all criminals. It's that they just don't believe it matters, that the distinction doesn't matter. And, and, and that's what um, uh, she, she talks about. Um, uh, the next point, uh, beginning right after that on page 116, is, her in, is the question about the problem solvers from her essay, The Pentagon on, on Lying and Politics on the, on, on the Pentagon Papers. And, um, you know, this is, is, as you know, this is something I've talked a lot about. I've tried to write a lot about it. Um, but she stops her and says, you know, I know what you're saying. Let me just explain. And let me explain, she says, with one example. And the example is the domino theory, right? She says, no one actually believed the domino theory, or maybe two people did, she says. But, you know, you know, there was no, it was no sense that, you know, if one country falls to communism, then all the others will fall. I mean, that's, it was just, it was a theory. It, you know, it maybe had some explanatory or rhetorical value, but it wasn't, it didn't conform, conform to reality. But people believed it because it gave them a framework. And, um, and, and I think this, this, uh, this idea of, of the way that professional problem solvers uh, embrace a theory when they know it's not true, but because it gives them a framework is, is rampant in our politics and in our world today. Um, and, uh, and you could ask, you know, we could come up with, I think, dozens of examples, but what are some, you know, theories that just seem absurd uh and yet people hold on to them even though they know they're absurd right um one would be you know uh maybe open borders right uh or or on the other side um you know that we're a nation of americans and we should close our borders i mean two equally absurd theories and yet um people hold on to them knowing that they can't be actualized because they provide a kind of framework to fund the police again, I don't. I mean, I, I, I again, what you know when you confront people with it, they say, "Oh, I don't really mean to fund the police." True, great, but it's a it's one of those things that uh, you know just it's a it's a theory people put out there for rhetorical or other reasons. It's a framework, but it doesn't confront in any way with reality. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit, but uh, another. Another part that uh, I thought was worth talking about was on page 121 uh, when uh, Herrera asks her about liberalism. And her answer is, I hope I don't shock you if I tell you that I'm not at all sure I'm a liberal. Right? Um, uh, I think it's clear that Hannah Arendt is not a liberal. I don't think it means she's a conservative. Um, the way she describes it here, which uh, I think is something everybody should read, is that she takes a little bit from this person and a little bit from that person, and she tries to put it together in her own way. 
she's a, she is a really original thinker. Um, that originalism, that originality, expresses a kind of radical, or what she calls at the bottom, or he calls at the bottom, extreme freedom at the bottom of 122. Um, they, they discuss the quote from René Char, which she misquotes, right, that um, our inheritance is guaranteed by no testament. And he corrects her and says, actually, it was preceded by no testament. And she says, yes, yes, preceded by no testament. Um, this is a, a, a quote she discusses in a number of places, including the, the prologue uh, to Between Past and Future, um, where she uses it to say that um, René Char, who was a poet, who then joined the French resistance, um, uh, came alive during the resistance because he was engaged in acts of public freedom. He was actively involved in, 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 in resisting the Nazis and resisting the French um, uh, regime. And, and he felt alive. And so there's this example of what she means by public freedom, the engaged political action. And then as the war is coming to a close, he says that we realized that this happiness that we had experienced will not survive because it was um, uh, our this it, it's a heritage is not preceded by um, a testament. Um, it's not it doesn't have any it's not grounded anywhere in our in our world. We don't have a tradition of this public freedom that um, will will allow it to last. And 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 what RN says is to some degree. This is what she calls the break of tradition, the loss of tradition, the loss that we are, we, we're living in a world in which there's no, the traditions that have been carried over for thousands of years for the Western tradition and around the world are being broken. And we now live in this time of freedom, of extreme freedom to build new traditions. And, and that freedom is scary as all hell, right? It really is. And one of the consequences of it was totalitarianism, uh, cause and consequence. Um, and people are terrified of it. And yet she says there's a great opportunity there. It's, she calls it on 122, one of the great advantages of our time. Because we can now, we're in a position that very few people are ever in in history, which is that we're living amidst the breaking down of tradition. You know, most people live at times of traditional conservatism. The world doesn't change much, but there are moments of breakdown, or moments of transition, right? You know, we can think of a couple, classical Athens, uh, the, the birth of Christ or the, 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 the period around the birth of Christianity, um, the 17th and 18th centuries and the emergence of liberalism, uh, the 19th century in, 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 in Massachusetts and in New England with the birth of a kind of Republican democracy. Um, uh, there are moments of true transition in the world um, in which uh, the people who live in them are free to build something new. And that's on the one hand terrifying and on the other hand, uh, a great uh, advantage. And, and, and this is what she means by living without banisters or thinking without banisters. We're at a time in which the banisters have all fallen and the pillars have fallen, another metaphor she uses. And, and we're at this time of, of freedom. And she talks about it in language very reminiscent of language she uses in thinking and moral considerations, um, where she says that to think critically is always to be hostile. This is on 123. Every thought actually undermines whatever there is of rigid rules, general convictions, et cetera. Everything which happens in thinking is subject to a critical examination of whatever there is that is, there are no dangerous thoughts for the simple reason that thinking itself is such a dangerous enterprise. This is another phrase of that famous line. She says that there are no dangerous thoughts. Thinking itself is dangerous. Thinking is destructive. It's nihilistic. It undermines traditions. And yet, as she says there and she says here, um, I think non-thinking is even more dangerous. I don't that I don't deny that thinking is dangerous, but I would say not thinking is even more dangerous. And, and, and that's um, that's really how I think she understands the time we live in. What is thinking in this case, critical thinking? Well, it's undermining, but it's also about potentially founding, founding anew, 
founding new um, traditions. But that can't be done intentionally in a sense. That has to be done from the ground up by people talking to each other in a pluralistic world, finding what they agree on and building up from that. And from that, you build new pillars and new traditions. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's other things here to talk about uh, on assimilation, which um, I'd love to come back to. The last exchange is about Eichmann again. And I think she, she adds something um, to her understanding of Eichmann here that isn't widely uh, incorporated in her other texts. So I'll just point it out, which is um, this quote by Bertolt Brecht, um, where he says, the great political criminals must be exposed and exposed especially to laughter. They are not great political criminals, but people who permitted great political crimes, which is something entirely different. The failure of his, failure of his enterprise does not indicate that Hitler was an idiot. So um, this, 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 this belief that Eichmann uh, was, was an idiot, I mean, I'm sorry, was a, was, a, was, what, was a clown and that one needed to simply laugh at him um, uh, is, is something I think uh, Arendt adds to her understanding of the Eichmann uh, event here. And I'll just point you to the last, well, the last paragraph before the last three dots on page 132, where she says, so Eichmann, for instance, was bothered never by anything which he had done to the Jews in general. But he was bothered by one little incident. He had slapped the face of the then president of the Jewish community in Vienna during an interrogation. God knows many worse things were happening to many people than to be slapped in the face. But this he had never condoned himself for having done. And he thought this was wrong, very wrong indeed. He had lost his cool, so to speak. Um, she thinks that he was just someone, she thinks that someone, he was someone who did many terrible, evil things, um, but he was a laughable figure. And that um, laughing at him in this way uh, is the um, best way to undermine him. Uh, something to think about as we think about um, people who are doing evil uh, in the world today. All right, I'll stop there. Uh, and open it to questions. Uh, and there's a lot in this interview. Uh, some I skipped over, so feel free to bring up other things and um, look forward to the discussion. As always, you can engage in the discussion um, in the chat with each other. I, I encourage you and request that you be civil and engage uh, the ideas and not the people. Uh, and then you can also go down to your reactions button at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom screen and click on raise hands and uh, raise your hand and I will call on you in the order people raise their hands. Great, uh, first up is, is it Rachel or Raquel? You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Raquel. Do you know how to, uh, am I, or is it me? Are you speaking? I don't hear you. Um, uh, let's see if I can unmute you. Do you know how to unmute yourself? Um, all right. While Rachel figures this out, I'm going to go on to the next person and you try and I don't know if you need to restart your computer. Can other people hear Rachel or is it just me? No. Um, all right, Rachel, I'm going to go on and you try and figure it out. And uh, John, you're up. Um, as always, thank you. Um, there, there, there's a couple of points that I just want to touch on as regards to the um, the this, this interview, which was totally engrossing in, on many different levels for me. Anyway, the Pentagon Papers and the Domino Theory, I, um, to my understanding, um, it was Dulles and Eisenhower who succumbed to the theory, particularly John Forster Dulles, 
and began the entire encounter in um, 1954 that we had to supplant the French. And um, I think he convinced Eisenhower, Dulles convinced Eisenhower to have um, maybe 3,000 men on the ground, et cetera, and how small consequences or how small incidences always lead to much larger consequences. That's always intrigued me. But um, the principal area that, that fascinated me about this interview um, centered upon her discussion, a brief discussion about um, the Jewish state and the identity and the risk of assimilation by the diaspora. And from my perspective, it really is backwards. I'd like to flip that discussion for a moment, if I may. The, the great risk is not the assimilation or the demise of the Jewish people in my mind, because, uh, and, and I'll mention two reasons why I think that, but I just want to point out that, I want to point out that the, my principal concern is the assimilation of Israel into the family of nations and the risk of the state of Israel becoming oppressive or uh, tyrannical in its own aspects. And I think that's a greater risk. And um, I think the risk to the state of Israel is the state of Israel. What I think unites the Jewish people on all different levels, and I as a reformed Jew do not relate to many practices and beliefs and, um, and, and, and concepts that the ultra-Orthodox or even the uh, modern Orthodox might subscribe to. Uh, my background is um, of a Reformed Jewish nature. I've uh, been involved in the Reformed Jewish community. But what unites me to the entire Jewish people, and I think will is the origin and will be the continuing thread of the of the Jewish people, um, which includes, uh, if I may add, Jews of choice, and also Jews who are uh, in the adoption of patrilineal descent, which she doesn't speak about, but I think it preceded the, it, it succeeded this interview, which the reform movement um, uh, adopted. But I think it's the Torah. I think it's the acknowledgement that there's a central theology, there is a central, that there is a book that has united the Jewish people for the ages. And uh, as long as that document, testament exists in my mind, the Jewish people will exist. I think the fact that Israel may come and go um, I don't think that will cause the failure uh, at all of the Jewish people. I think it will be a sadness to many aspects of the diaspora, but I don't think that would, um, that's the principal risk. And I think as a Jew, as a reformed Jew, I am united to other branches of, 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 of Judaism, not by practice, but more by we identify with the Torah. And she doesn't mention that, but I, for me, that is a, um, a, a, a principle or, or unify, unifying thread within the Jewish community. Thanks, Thank Jeff. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of skipped over uh, this, these pages and I appreciate your bringing us back to them, especially since, um, as you all know, in September, we're gonna start uh, reading her book, um, uh, Arendt and the Jewish Question, uh, a book of essays edited by Jerry Cohn and Ron Feldman. Um, and so we will have um, many more opportunities to talk about some of these questions then. Um, you know, you're, on your claim that what unites the Jews, uh, is, as you put it, is the Torah, um, you know, clearly she disagrees with that, right? Which is not to say you're wrong or she's right, or I have no idea. Um, she has, a, I think, a, a, a somewhat radical 
uh, view here on page 128 um, that, you know, unlike Christianity, which is a creed and a faith, um, she says that Judaism is much more of a national religion where nation and religion coincide. Um, this is obviously a very controversial point. Uh, it's it's one of the you know the the idea that Jews are a nation and not a religion is sometimes considered to be anti-Semitic. Um, uh, um, but what she means by it is that um, uh, if you're a Jew, you never cease to be a Jew according to Jewish law. It's it's not something you 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 pick up by by choice. It's who you are. Um, uh, and, um, that this is not just a religion, which she says is an altogether different notion. It's much more a way of life than it is a religion, uh, in at least as a Christian understands religion. This is the bottom of 128. Um, and then she gives her background. I had a Jewish instruction, religious instruction, and I wanted to rebel and do something. And I said, I don't believe in God, where her rabbi said, who asked you? Um, I take that to I take the point to be that in in Judaism it doesn't really it's not nearly as much as in Christianity a matter of belief it's a matter of identity a matter of um, uh, being part of a, a community a national community. Um, well, with uh, all due respect, uh, Roger, I I would you could flip that argument in my opinion by saying yeah the um, that may be so but I've existed as a Jew. Uh, prior to uh, the existence of Israel, um, I was uh, I was proud and 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 it unified many aspects and parts of the Jewish community. But we survived hundreds of years, thousands of years, without a state. We've lost the 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 state of Israel numerous times in the history, and 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 yet Judaism didn't survive. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that's the counter to her argument. I think the counter to her argument is, is that at that turns Judaism into simply an identity rather than uh, a religious experience or bond. And I think many Jews would find that to be um, uh, wrong. Um, but she would agree with you that you don't need the state of Israel um, to be a Jew. Uh, and um, uh, and she also would agree with you that you can criticize the state of Israel, um, but, you, you know, as a Jew, as she says at the top of 126, um, and, uh, and she doesn't think the Jews will disappear. She says a collective is on the bottom of 126, a collective doesn't commit suicide. And the, this Mr. Friedman who thought that the Jews would end because they would assimilate, she says is wrong because while intellectuals may change nationalities and absorb other cultures, people don't. And the the general Jewish people will uh, generally uh, not, um, uh, you know, simply lose their Jewishness in order to assimilate to a, a larger culture. Um, so yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I I simply you know I guess maybe what what I uh, was looking for, and I know you would put it in the nature of I guess religion or creed, but I think the unifying um fred is the torah yeah and, i mean and I, I think i the, hear what you're john i hear what you're saying i think she just disagrees yeah um, no no i get it I which get is it. which is which is fine interestingly enough in a, in her in a in a letter to to gershom sholem um where she's describing someone's going to correct me i think she's describing something that golda Meir said um uh where she, you know, she says that what holds us together, I forget what she said, Golda, like it's like the state of Israel. RN said, you know, it was a shocking statement because what you thought would hold the Jewish people together was a belief in God and the Torah, as you said. Um, so, you know, in that particular letter, which I haven't gone back and consulted today or in, in the last few years, but um, I should, you know, we should if we wanted to have this debate. She maybe takes closer to your side, or at least uh, at least opens up the argument closer to your side. Um, uh, so, I, I I don't know. Um, I don't know how. I'll be honest. I don't know how 
um, um, how seriously to take this claim of hers that Judaism is less a religion than Christianity and more of a, a, a national religious meld. You know, um, this isn't a part of her work that I have um, spent a huge amount of time on. So actually, this is an advertisement for the next part of the reading group. We're going to be reading her book on Jewish writings. Um, I'm hoping as we go through that, some of these questions will will reappear. Um, I, I, if I may just add one other thing. Um, in my history uh, and association in the Jewish community, and I myself would quote, if someone asked me, do you believe in God? I'd say, I'm an agnostic. I'm not an atheist. Um, I'm not that presumptuous to know that there doesn't exist when I find that the existence of God uh, an impenetrable question. And so I just don't know. And I've not only, um, and, and, and in response to uh, the, re the, re the, the remark of the rabbi saying, well, who asked you? I've heard responses by rabbis throughout, um, nor am I. Yeah. Or okay. nor do I. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we'll go on. Um, yeah, and thank you very many, much. Any more discussions about this when we read the Jewish writings? Uh, did, um, who was, hold on. Who was the person who couldn't speak before? Is she back? She left. All right, James. It was Rachel. Is Rachel here? Did she want to try again? I don't want to. I don't want to not recognize her if she wants to try again. Rachel, are you able to? All right, here. James. Hi, I'm here. I'm here. Can you oh. hear me? Yes, you are here. Okay. Great. Okay, I'll try it with just the microphone. Um, I was really excited, or happy or uh, intrigued, uh, energized by the fact that she, the question of liberalism emerges. Mm. And I think it's, I mean, something that it's very hard to be clear about what we mean by a liberal. We don't, that it's a term that means different things, obviously, in different historical contexts and to different people. I can't help but think of the explicit reference she makes in the last chapter of imperialism in the origins of totalitarianism because there she, uh, she in a footnote where she explains why it is that she uh, is not an advocate for one world government, particularly according to the plans put forth at the time, which are by progressive humanists, probably namely Julian Huxley, the, the first transhumanist as it were. And, um, and she basically explains that the liberal theory of power is the Habesian theory of power and liberalism kind of quickly becomes utilitarianism. And so the merger between liberalism and utilitarianism is very, very close there. It's a very uh, kind of weird um, moment in, in political theory, I, I would say. But I think it, it kind of forces us, if we, are, if we allow it at least, or something like that, uh, what, however you might think about that, is... Um, to pay it a little more attention critically to where we are right now. We've been in the middle of a so-called public health emergency, and there is plans for a pandemic treaty, which will remove the national sovereignty or boundaries um, and give that to unelected bureaucrats. And I think arguably from an Arendtian perspective, she would say that this would be a totalitarian grab for power and a much bigger danger than the fascism, for instance, we see emerging in Italy like yesterday, right? Don't we have like a new fascist dictator? And so as we think about what the real dangers are here and, and what's liberalism and, and whatnot, I really think um, this essay invites us to be critical of our own time. And the, the one other point that I think this essay invites on that, or at least probably just one of many, is the, um, the, the reference to the domino theory. Because if we have somebody uh, kind of self-proclaimed Orentian like Ann Applebaum claiming that we need to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian in Ukraine, um, that, that would seem to be um, an instance of uh, the modern version of the domino theory. If you're like a left anti-imperialist like I am, maybe not everyone would see it that way. Other people might think that everything that the U.S. empire does is good and NATO is all good and everything is 
always good and we can only view totalitarian ideology from the standpoint of the authoritarians, not from our own globalist agenda. Um, it, it might look different, but but I would say we this essay invites us to be self-critical of our own empire from the standpoint of the anti-imperialist left. Thank you, Rachel. I'm glad you got your microphone working. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, really important, um, uh, a lot of really important ideas and comments in your in your comment slash question. I don't know if it's a question, more of a comment. Um, what I'll add to it or or or, or supplement it with is that um, I, I think you are absolutely right uh, to focus on the Habesian um, foundation of. Of, of liberalism, at least within Arendt's thinking. Yeah. Um, you know, when she says she's not a liberal, what she means is she doesn't believe that uh, we should elevate a Leviathan state yeah. in a unified format, um, which is supposed to represent everybody as a homogenous people and 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 govern them in order to um, maximize freedom and minimize pain um i've mentioned this i mentioned the what i consider to be the best book on liberalism uh many times in this group over the years uh which is uday meta's book liberalism and empire um in which um what uday meta does is to show that if you look at the original liberal thinkers, Hobbes, Mill, um, uh, and, and others, uh, they were imperialists, as Rachel is rightly saying. They believed that um, the people who were, sub who were able to um, govern themselves in self-government uh, were people who were civilized people, who were part of uh, a civilized, educated class and that empire was justified because other peoples were not so civilized and thus not able to to justify themselves which is why um good liberals are often good imperialists um and uh because they believe that they as well-educated rational people are better able to uh govern and than, than natives or people who um, are not yet ready to govern themselves. The, the, the hero of Meta's account and also of Arendt's is Edmund Burke, a conservative, who argues that um, we should respect the rights of people to live differently. And that's part of Arendt's pluralism. Um, and so uh, if you think of it from a in-depth point of view, I think that's what Arendt means when she says she's not a liberal. Um, uh, when you then, you know, you then look at the crisis of liberal, democ de liberal democracies going on around the world today, would Arendt be worried about um, uh, the rise of illiberal states, be it Hungary or Russia or China or Venezuela or maybe Italy? Um, and that's an interesting question. Um, on the one level, uh, you know, you could say no. I mean, she thinks people should be able to live differently and tyrannies and, and dictatorships will emerge and we maybe don't want them, but they're not the worst thing in the world. What we don't want is to sort of engage in a liberal imperialist project to tell everyone they have to live like us. Uh, on the other hand, um, for those who I, 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 I do think, I, I do think RN does believe in a kind of um, uh, world, a kind of legalized or at least normalized normative world order in which um, we respect the right of people to live differently. And I don't believe she believes in the real politique of Russia controls Ukraine and China controls Taiwan. Um, and so therefore, um, you know, if you want to preserve that normative world order, you may have to fight for it. And she's certainly not a pacifist. I think if you're trying to impose your view on Russia or China, she would be against that. That would be a kind of liberal imperialism. But if you're trying to protect the right of Ukraine to 
to live in its own way, I think she would probably be in favor of that. Although, again, I, I'm not in the business of telling you what Arendt would say, and I don't mean to be saying that. I'm just saying, as I understand it, um, there's an argument. There's a just, there's an argument for being against liberal imperialism and yet also being for uh, a, a, no, a legalized normative world order where you respect um, uh, you respect uh, the rights of different peoples to, um, to to govern themselves as they wish. Um, I just not, just if if I could just say one thing, does that mean um, sometimes there's a distinction made between the Americans' assertion of the rules-based order and that I think from from what I gather from the perspective of the majority of the population on the planet, that rules-based order might be normative, but it's certainly not consistent with international law like having a sanctions regime or you know intervening in other countries to do whatever those those things are violations of international law and so um i don't know like is a multipolar world consistent with uh what we can say is Arendt's text um uh because it seems to me that it's possible arguably that at some point, I don't know if it was around the time Hannah Arendt died, but people started using the uh, origins of totalitarianism as a how-to manual. And the, her, her notion of total dominance, that is conceptually identical to full spectrum domination, which is the official posture of the Pentagon towards not only the other countries in the world, but towards the planet itself. And so the idea that we, we can have some normative liberal interventionism that is, I don't know, I, I feel like she says very clearly in those prefaces, that preface in the 60s, that the only thing we cannot abide is the totalitarian impulse for total domination. And not only that, it has to have some, you know, capacity to actually bring it into fruition. She says Mussolini was not Hitler. National author nationalist authoritarianism is not totalitarianism. And if we are not very clear as people who are studying a rent, that those things are to be distinguished in her text, we might be perverting her message. Well, I mean, again, I, I think everything you said, except for the stuff about the Pentagon being about total domination, which I don't understand, but everything else you said, I think I agree with, and it's similar to what I said, which is um, I don't think she supports or would support a kind of liberal imperialism that seeks to change um, the politics of other countries, the way of life of other countries. Um, I do think she supports um, uh, giving arms to countries who want to fight for their freedom. I mean, she's someone who deeply, you know, she wrote, we're going to read in, in the next book on, on Jewish writings, we're going to read her belief that the way the Jews should have responded to the Nazis was to raise Jewish armies and, and, and give them weapons. Um, she certainly supported um, revolutionaries fighting for freedom. Um, and I, and I, and I, and she, you know, again, I, I don't know if she would be in favor of giving the Ukrainians military weapons or not. I, I, I have no way of knowing that. Um, but I think she would certainly be in favor of supporting freedom fighters fighting, uh, against an attack from a neighboring country. Um, at least that's my impression. I could be wrong. Um, we, I, I seem to have messed up the queue because uh, James was next and now he's not in it. Is James, are you still on it? No, I decided to not waste everybody's time with my question. All right. Um, humble. Uh, Ken, you're next. Thanks, Roger. Um, I've been reading a lot of these conversations thinking about January 6th at the same time and found that like what you said about the criminality in the political process, it's really helpful, but there were so many facets to these readings that reflected on. I just wanted to uh, run through a few of them, hopefully really quickly, because there's a lot, um, and then see what your opinion is on these. I'm, so I guess I'm trying to put together what Arendt would be saying about January 6th, and she would, the way she does, she looks at everything from so many different angles. I found a lot of useful thoughts besides the uh, criminality in the political process. One was the, that the tyranny in the executive branch 
was underestimated in the constitution and that it, the significance of the constitution, uh, because of the significance of the constitution, the crisis is much higher when it's violated in this country than other countries. Um, those were the, those were two that the decline in Trump's power led him to using force, that losing the election was what led to what seems clear of his leadership of the, the riot. Um, first, he tried to push the military, got turned down by the generals, then he was trying the police, and then he tried this big uh, stunt, it seemed like. Um, I found that also useful. Um, but she also said that armed uprising by itself has never yet led to a revolution. And that seems like what we had. We had an armed uprising without any real leadership. Um, that, so that when she said about the student movements, that there was a curious despair about them. It reminded me also of the January 6th that she said, as though they said to themselves, at least we want to have provoked our defeat. That also rang true to me. Um, and especially where she says the really perverse form of acting is functioning. It seemed like what the January 6th writers were doing was functioning. And that distinction she makes between acting seemed really relevant. Um, but also their joy in acting together seemed really clear. That feeling of power she talks about that arise from them acting together. Um, and that that feeling of power isn't good or bad from what she said. Uh, but where they seem to be derailed is in their, in who they were choosing to follow and in their black and white mentality. Um, that she says a real analysis could pave the way for a revolution that also seemed relevant. Um, and also Trump, that him wanting everyone to believe in his images and nobody should, this is, she's talking about the Pentagon, but it seemed to apply to Trump. He wanted everyone to believe in his images and nobody should look beyond them. And that is of course, an altogether different political will. She says it is really the will to dominate. Um, and what seemed to be happening, at least in that community, some of this I'm taking from the earlier. Yeah, I know. Of the Republic. I mean, the. The, the last interview, yeah, the second to last interview. Yeah, second to last. Um, but the, the place that I ended up was getting back to their judgment. And what led me to it was what you said, the black and white mentality, with a black and white mentality, one can do nothing but smash the world to bits in order to have before one's eyes one thing, plain black. Um, it seemed like that was happening. And then in terms of their judgment, it seemed like what with Trump's fiction, well, not just Trump, but the whole Republican party, that the sense of cleanness, first of all, was too small, it was within the Republican party, but it was turned upside down, which I think where she was leading in judgment was to say that the census communists could be upside down. According to what they were doing, they were doing the right thing. If they believe that the election was stolen, they should riot and, and do whatever they can to, turn, to take power back. Um, but their sense as communists was upside down, but any sort of common sense would refute that. And I think that was the distinction at the end of judgment. Bring that back Thanks. in. Anyway. Thanks, Ken. Um, you know, those are my notes. Tr trying to um, trying to sort of figure out what Aaron would say about January 6th is, 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 is always going to be hazardous. Um, so let's start with the basics, right? We're on page 114. Um, where she talks about the constitutional crisis. Um, and she's here talking about Watergate, but uh, I think it fits. The, she says the, the Constitution itself was somehow at fault. Uh, what she means by that uh, is that the Constitution failed to do partly what it was supposed to do, according to the founders. Uh, which was to um, uh, provide for a weak executive that would simply uh, administer um, what the legislative branch uh, uh, decided. Now, one could simply say she was wrong in reading the Constitution because that's not what the Constitution has done. Um, 
Or one could say that, you know, she brings out one side of the Constitution, but there was also um, lurking in the Constitution uh, an executive power that could be freed. Um, I, you know, I think there's, I think there's arguments on all these sides. Um, the, the leaving aside that her thinking, right, is that it's important that the United States was not imagined as a democracy. Um, they, they didn't think they were a democracy. They thought they were a Republican rule, small r Republican. And what is Republican, right? And this is one of these constant questions in political theory. Um, when I teach this stuff, it's what we spend a lot of time on. What does it mean to be a Republican? Well, at its base, it means self-government. Um, but it doesn't mean self-government by uh, an elected representative elite necessarily. Um, what it means is a self-government, and here's where she, here's how she frames it on 114, um, is most concerned about preserving the rights of minorities because they believed in a healthy body politic, there must be a plurality of opinions. What republicanism means for Hannah Arendt is it's a form of self-government that has limits on democratic majoritarianism that protects the rights of minorities. Now, by minority, she means minority opinions. Um, you know, to bring back Rachel's worry about liberalism and Arendt's claim that she's not a liberal. This is going to be a little, I know some of you are not going to like this, but one way to read what's going on in politics in the United States is that the victory of liberalism in the United States has um, created a kind of um, uh, sacra union, union sacred, or what she talks about here, le, un, le union sacre, uh, a kind of national of opinion, which has increasingly um, uh, not preserved the rights of certain minorities. Um, uh, and and these would most many of these would be conservative minority groups, and that um, and that a lot of the political action uh, from the Tea Party on uh, over the last thirty or so years has been a, 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 a grassroots reaction against that. Um, now, uh, that's that's nothing to do with January sixth, right? That's just understanding, um, I think, some of the political situation that we're in um, uh, to some uh, in the United States and, and in many liberal democracies around the world in which these liberal democracies have become increasingly uh, run by a kind of uh, professional problem solving elite that thinks they know how to um, govern and, and, and doesn't want to listen to the people. I think that's um, very much of an Arendtian analysis of it. Um, the January 6th thing is, is complicated for a whole host of reasons. I mean, you know, one is that a lot of these folks who were actually at the Capitol, which is not the people in Trump's office, really did believe what they were being told, which is that the election was stolen. And they thought of themselves as, 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 as doing something um, to preserve the election. Now, some didn't, uh, and violence is not the way to do it. I'm not trying to justify it. But the problem was the people in Trump's office, the people, you know, the, the 30 or 40 of them we've been, we've been listening to, who knew what the president was doing was wrong, knew what was going on was wrong, and simply stood by and did nothing. Um, the cowards in, in throughout the government, on the Repu mostly in the Republican Party. Um, and, 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 and that's been um, incredibly uh, depressing to witness. Um, but uh, I don't know uh, much more about what Arendt would make of all of that. Um, and, you know, I think she would, I would hope she would have uh, an original interpretation of a lot of it. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear, you know, people talk about it. I have my ideas, I write about it, um, but uh, I'm not willing to say much more about what I think her views on that are. Um, I think it's dangerous to do that. Jerry, you're up. Uh, 
Roger, I, I want to say that I want to speak from my own personal experience here. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not sure you want to hear that. <laughs> I don't know whether to continue or not. Please do, Jerry. Well, this happened during my time. This is when I worked for Aaron. And I knew Roger very well. And he and I worked closely together on this, on the, what was filmed. And uh, as re, you said, Roger, in the beginning, a lot of it is lost. I, both in New York and in Paris and in really in a lot of parts of France, with Roger, went and tried to put this film together. And it is partial. It is not the complete thing by any means. What I, what I did to prepare for this was not to read it over again, but to look, you, you had that on, on the website, you could actually see it. That was very important to me to go back to that because there Hannah was, and I don't find her here today. Uh, let me put it this way. When, when you were with her, the lines that came to mind were written by not her favorite poet, not my favorite poet, but still a very important poet. Walt Whitman, when, in, when he was in search of himself, said, described himself as being both in and out of the game, both in and out of the game, watching and wondering at it. Every word in that is a poet's word. And uh, it's not the only time, but it's relative for the mass of writing he did. To me, it's one of the few, relatively few moments when Whitman really was a great poet. The thing about Aaron's presence, it's all about time. From the very beginning, it was to seek the present. When I turned on that film this morning, it was the present that I heard. It was... Hannah was in and out of the game in 1973, and that out of the game, her reflection, and then it coming out in speech, which is incredibly important to her. It's why one of the most basic reasons she denied she was a philosopher is that the sense of hearing actually became more important to her than the sense of seeing. Uh, and, and that's because thinking appears in the world as words, when it appears. It certainly doesn't appear in all words. It's very rare for it to appear. And it's why Hannah Arendt is a difficult writer. Uh, when she, but when I listened to this this morning, um, or yesterday, she was there. It was that presence. It was that presence that is, comes from being not only in, but out of the game. It is the presence that sometimes she calls in Latin and with a religious overtone, nunc stans, that is a now that doesn't move. But the point is, ever since she took that sentence from, from, from Karl Jaspers, it appears as the motto for overall motto for origins of totalitarianism about the point is not to live in the past, not to live in the future, but only to live in the present. That is why she is not a philosopher, in my opinion. And that came so through to me watching this film of her in this interview because she was there, which is her first words, although they're about Watergate and Nixon in 1973, they are not only about that. They are about today. It is as if her light of her mind, as she described it once, is like a bit, her words are like those of a parable because the light of her mind is like a parabola that goes over its experience, its subject matter, and it brings out 
an x-ray of that. And in that x-ray, there is no foretelling the future or anything else. It's just seeing what is there. And when she says, talks about criminality coming into our government, the executive coming powerful more than, than, than it is in the Constitution, taking over, it's not really power anyway, it's more force and violence. She, when she calls this not only not a nation, but a country, but more than anything, when she distinguishes republicanism from democracy, the race publica is opposed to democracy. It is for the protection of minority rights. That's you. That's Hannah. That, that is when when you were with her. You that was that was alive to you. That was a living present. And there's something about her presence that has to be brought out. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say. The good things are going on in that respect. There's a wonderful book coming out about of all, of, uh, in all places in Israel, but it'll be out in English too. A wonderful book about Hannah, Hannah being at the uh, Netanyahu, anti-Netanyahu demonstrations uh, just a, a year, within a couple of years, about her being there. She's present at them. And then I got word later this week that Russian dissidents, social scientists from many universities and have, have to stop uh, teaching. They, they are being fired or taken over. Or, or, anyway, they've joined together. They've banded together from various Russian universities. They're leaving Russia, which is not easy to do. They're going to German, Germany, where they've been met a sponsor for their, and they're opening an institute, Russian, German, called Hannah Arendt. And I, this is what I like. This is what, she needs to be present in the world. It's that present tense, that she was after all her life, not simply a transition from past to future or from uh, future to past, not just something flowing, to stop it, to be there. She's got to be there. And there are people around the world who are realizing that, thank God. Thank you, I'm sorry that's a bit off the topic. I don't think it's off the topic at all. I mean, I think that's, I think that's I think that's why so many people are in this group and reading our rent around the world um, is that there is a profound feeling um, of her presence in the world, her meaningfulness in the world today, that we need her kind of thinking um, uh, to, to, to make us think radically, critically, critical thinking, uh, which is dangerous. Um, and, you know, I think that the danger is always saying this is what Harent would do. I, I, I try and, you know, I think, I think, I think Arendt would think critically uh, in every, in every situation. And at times she would act, she did act. We have to remember that she, she acted, joined with the Zionists in 1933. She worked with Euthia Leah. She worked against McCarthyism. There are times when she did act and, and that's an important part of it as well. But, as I understand it, you know, her the primary way she acted in the world was to think uh, as a conscious pariah, as someone from the outside, as you said, in and out, using Whitman's idea. Um, I think the conscious pariah fits very well with the Whitman in and outside. Um, I don't know if you if you see it that way. Um, uh, so yeah, um, I mean, everything you say uh, strikes me as as right on, Jerry. So I appreciate the. The intervention. Thank um, you, um, Bella. Nice to see you. It's been a while. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. I introduced myself first time, but I'm with you over 
four times, uh, I believe. Um, I'm from Russia. Um, I think I'm single in your group from Russia, from St. Petersburg, from the university um, where I work. Uh, at this university, uh, St. Petersburg State University, uh, has affiliated with your Bart College, as you know. Um, and uh, what I want to say that uh, this interview, I was very uh, surprised for me. It was uh, first time when I recognized that uh, uh, the, the thing, the main thing uh, in our not uh, not uh, uh, federation, uh, but national state. We are not a federation. We are national state because uh, during 20th century, even before and later, of course, right now, Russian language uh, was put uh, in the corner. My English is not so clear. So if you don't understand, just ask me, please. Uh, uh, Russian language was put uh, in the corner of our statement, uh, not statement, of our state. But actually, we have another nations, a lot of nations. Uh, myself, for example, I'm not only Russian, I'm Finnish, Finnogorian, and Jewish as well. Uh, so my, my daughter, Tatarian, Tatar, uh, as well. So um, uh, I want to say that for me it was a surprise that uh, our uh, state still not consti constituate, right? Constitution, uh, because uh, I guess you know our history, constitution history, we have it from Soviet Union, like in China, uh, like our media, uh, our constitution and our media uh, have uh, established in Soviet Union. Our cinema have, have, has established in uh, Soviet Union. Uh, so yes, before uh, when Catherine II, our empress, uh, she uh, believed uh, she has a relationship uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Rousseau uh, and other philosophers, and uh, she believed that constitution is the best thing. But after some rebellions in Russia, uh, she said no, imperialism is better. Simply to say. Uh, then Alexander II, uh, uh, another imperialist, uh, uh, another uh, side of Russian side, uh, he decided. Uh, uh, he decided how to say this word. I forgot. Sorry. Um, uh, he decided to reform um, serfdom, suffrage. Uh, right, so mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, but he uh, also decided no, constitution is not for Russia because of uh, uh, again uh, because of the people. Uh, people uh, uh, prefer to rebel, uh, so to protest. So uh, they need more power. Um, uh, political uh, pressure. That's why he uh, he believes uh, constitution is not for Russia. And then uh, we've had first constitution finally in Soviet Union and very beginning of Soviet Union, 1918. Then we've had a lot of version of, of this constitution. Then we've had in New Russia in 1990, the first, 1990, uh, second, only a few months of freedom, uh, where first Media Freedom Act was established uh, and uh, private uh, rules was established as well. And uh, 
then right now from last two years, as you know, we have another constitutional crisis. So we never being constituted. I just realized it and thank you for you uh, that you opened for me uh, my eyes, my mind. Uh, because in my country, uh, my students, for example, I'm talking with them uh, uh, always and ask them, uh, what do you know about Hannah Arendt? They, uh, they say, oh, it's, she's very popular because we, we know uh, that she's uh, written about, uh, about uh, totalitarianism, about our country as well. But I ask them, but what do you know? else probably you know about uh, another books uh, uh, about your issue uh, issue issues uh, but uh, they say no uh, it, it's too simple they said thank you thank it was very surprising for me so thank you for for the invitation uh, well, thank you, Bella. Uh, it's it's really um, it's wonderful, and especially after Jerry's comment about the Russian scholars um, forming uh, the Hannah Arendt Institute. Are, so, you do you teach Bella at at Smolny, where Bard used to have its college? Uh, no, 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 not the Smolny, uh, Saint Petersburg State University. But it's uh, uh, it's uh, the same uh, structure. A small, yes, yeah, small. But was today is very. Uh, I'm from journalistic uh, faculty, and um, yeah, very dangerous things right now. It's I, another another issue. We can speak about it if you want another time. I I imagine it is, and I appreciate your being here. I don't know if that's a a risk or not, but um, uh, you know, I think I think one of the things you bring up is that constitutions uh, are quite different and um you know Arendt writes a lot about how most constitutions don't last very much I think in in this somewhere along here she talks about the French constitution and she says how many of you have like 14 or 20 or or something like that and um and you, you know, you you talked about how in Russia they've had a lot of constitutions. Um, it's not in this in this as in this interview, but in the in the the book on revolution, she really does talk about how what made the American Revolution successful. And by and just so you all understand, the 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 point of a revolution for Hannah Arendt is what she calls the foundation of freedom, which is different from liberation. And she says that the real success of the American foundation of freedom um, was the fact that the Constitution in the United States became worshipped and became um, uh, a, 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 a worshipped document to preserve um, the Federalist principle of non-sovereignty, that there would be no single nation and that it would be a, const a civic Republican constitution of protecting minorities um and 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 that worship of the constitution as a document that embodies the belief in the fundamental need to protect minorities and plurality of opinion within the country um uh, is unique it doesn't happen in most constitutional systems and it's what she thinks made america special um, and made it possible for there to be a, a foundation of freedom. The, the last chapter of the book, which is called The Lost Treasure, um, is about how over the course of the 20th century, the American constitutional tradition is being watered down and lost. It is being nationalized. It's being liberalized in the sense of liberal nationalism. And she has, you know, she as, as Rachel rightly points out, she does blame national security, uh, and she talks about this on page 115 here, the rise of national security, which she says is a new word in the American vocabulary, um, is part of what nationalizes the government and turns it into a unity against minorities instead of 
as simply a, a space for the protection of minority opinions in a Republican tradition. Um, and so she's very worried about the loss of this American constitutional tradition. Um, you know, I think we haven't talked about it much, but the Supreme Court and the loss of the authority of the Supreme Court in the country today um, on both left and right uh, is an extraordinary um, danger to uh, the liberal, the, to, the, to, the, to the constitutional tradition as Arendt understands it. In fact, she says at the end of On Revolution that the one thing that could really destroy America would be the loss of the reverence for the constitution. And uh, I, I don't know if that's happened yet or not, but it's certainly um, uh, it's certainly uh, in the air. So, um, so yeah, Bella, I wish you luck. I hope you join us for future meetings and I'd uh, love to talk to you more about what's going on there. Yes, um, sure. thank you very much. Jenny, you're up next. Thank you. Um, maybe before I ask my question, if anyone has more information on that institute you mentioned that was being founded, any articles? I'd uh, love to be appointed <laughs> that way. But um, Jerry, if maybe if you can, uh, if you can let me know, I can let people know. That would be great. Unless, um, unless Jerry, you can say something about it now. I don't know if he's still here. Okay, go ahead, Jenny. So my question, if it's a question, is the, the part of the interview that I really um, was fascinated by was I believe when it was talk, talking about the Pentagon Papers, they were, she said they were scared of freedom or they were afraid of freedom and they were afraid of being afraid of freedom. And I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, give it a bit more context in, in her wider thinking. Um, yeah, so that's, that's on page 119 to 18 to 120. It's um, so, and what she's, it's introduced by this question about historical determinism. Um, uh, which is, uh, um, has its roots in, in Hegel, uh, and, uh, is made politically popular by Marx and Marxists, um, uh, and others as well, but, um, that's how Arendt often, uh, engages it. But the idea that, um, uh, a kind of theory uh, or his, a history follows certain ideas, right? For in Hegel, the idea that the the rational is real and the real is rational, uh, and that you need to reconcile reality and idea. In in Marx, the the the, the claim that um, uh, the history follows knowable laws of development that we can push, um, and um, and so Herrera brings this up and, and she says, yeah, this is a, this belief is, is a, is a problem and it's just wrong because history is, man is free, man is natal, man is spontaneous. And we always do things that frustrate theory. And then he asks on 119, but if our contemporaries cling fast to determinist ways of thinking, in spite of being refuted by history, do you think it's because they're afraid of freedom? And she says, absolutely. They're afraid of freedom. What does this mean? It means that um, when you that you're afraid of letting people do and be who they want to be, you're afraid of the people, um, and sometimes for good reason because the people can do terrible things. Uh, but what the intellectuals, the people who seem to say they know the rules of history, uh, want to do is guide history um, and not allow the people to guide it. Um, and so she says, sure, and rightly so, only they don't say it. If they did say that they were afraid of freedom, one could immediately start a debate, right? You could have a debate. Well, okay, should we, should we let the people be free? Should we let the people make more decisions or should we guide them? Um, you know, uh, go back to what I was saying about Burke versus Mill, Bill, you know, Mill says, you know, only the educated can 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 make judgments. Burke says no. People could live however they want. Let them make judgments. Um, uh, you know, uh, we've talked a lot about in this group in the last few weeks or months about the idea of citizen assemblies, and there are people who say 
citizen assemblies are a great idea. They let the people, you know, govern. And other people say, that's a terrible idea. The people, we don't want the people to govern. We need to let experts, you know, govern. Um, uh, that's what she means by being afraid of freedom. She brings up um, uh, McNamara because she says that the um, quote, that she quotes from McNamara at the beginning of Lying in Politics, which is in the footnote, quote, at the bottom of 120, the picture of the world's greatest superpower killing or seriously injuring a thousand non-combatants a week while trying to pound a tiny backward nation into submission on an issue whose merits are hotly disputed is not a pretty one. And what she's saying is in Europe, this is, again, this is her view, they would never have asked this question because the Europeans believe in the reason of state and believe in the rule of experts. But McNamara was able to commission the Pentagon Papers, and she thinks that it's um, uh, a uniquely American idea. By the way, you know, the January 6th commission, you know, is it is you can't but read this and think about it. She says he asks her then, do you think that at present American leaders faced with other situations still want to know? Do we want to know the truth? Well, look what's happening in the January 6th commission. Half the politicians in Congress don't want to know the truth and half do want to know the truth. I mean, it's very clear. And so her answer is, no, I don't think that a single one is left who wants to know the truth. But then she says, I don't know. No. No, I take that back, but I don't believe that. I think that McNamara was on Nixon's list of enemies, if I'm not mistaken, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this shows you that the whole attitude has gone out of American politics, that it is on the highest level. It is no longer there. They believed, you see, these people, they already believed in image making, but still with a vengeance. Why didn't we succeed with image making? And one can say that it was only images, you know. But now they want everybody to believe in their images and nobody should look beyond them. And that is, of course, an altogether different political will. Well, I mean, I don't want to put anyone up on a pedestal here, but Liz Cheney has made um, uh, people, she's, I mean, you know, you could point her and say she's like the McNamara here. She asked the question. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I I, this is not to say Liz Cheney is the greatest person in the world or not, um, but it is. To, I will say this. Um, she's taking a huge chance. She may not get elected. And some someone just asked me the other day, well, why do you think she's taking that chance? And I say she's playing the long game. If American democracy, civic Republican democracy, constitutional democracy survives, which is the question, but I think it's a good bet. If it survives, Liz Cheney will go down as a hero in this in this right? She will. She'll be the McNamara of this era. And, um, and, uh, and Casey, and Casey Hutchins as well. Um, but Liz Cheney really started it. And, and, uh, you know, there's not many of them, not many at all. Kitsinger, Kits, what's his, the other one, Kits, Kitsinger and, and sure, and her. I mean, it's very few people, but there's still a few who believe in this idea of freedom of letting people know the truth um, and not uh, insisting that they be told their framework. And, you know, for that, I can't but be grateful for what she's doing and what the January 6th commission is doing. But that's what I think um, she's talking about here, that there's this idea of actually um, believing that the people do have a right to self-government, that the people have a right to know and that we should, um, that mistakes will be made, of course, right? The Vietnam War, things will go bad, but we have a duty to let them know the truth and put the truth out there. That's what I think she's talking about here. If I could just ask one follow-up question. Is it only in the sense of a fear of the political freedom in the sense of a fear of the people? Or is there a psychological element here as well of, historical determinism being I don't know, a comfort blanket against that that I part of their contingency that comes obviously with a lot of responsibility and and danger well i think it's both i mean i think there's a, a fear of the people uh that's widespread on both 
amongst intellectuals of all political persuasions, right? Um, and I think, uh, um, so that's, that's one part of it. Um, and uh, what was the other, the other side of it that you said was? Um, I guess a more individual psychological fear. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's um, a strong sense of, of many experts and intellectuals that they know best. Um, and that they should be running things. Um, uh, and that the world is rational and um, we should, if we're the rational people, we should be running it. Um, you know, the conference that we're having in the fall, Rage and Reason, is about that. I mean, it's, it's, it's about this idea that over the last, that, you know, most of human history is governed not by reason, but by feeling emotions and rage. Over the last 300 years, we have increasingly put in place expert regimes of governance that have sought to rationalize government. I think one of the things you're seeing around the world is a loss of faith in expert scientific rational leadership. And as that happens, rage and emotions are gonna come back. They are coming back. And the question is how we address that. Um, that's what the conference is about in the fall. Um, Denny, quickly, we're out of time, but I'll let you ask a quick question because we're not gonna meet for a month, so. Oh, quick. okay, yeah, yeah, I know, hi. Um, you know, I, understand. I don't know if you can hear me because my internet connection is not the best one, but uh, okay. Uh, I understand, uh, you know, the reasons why Arden points out that the USA is not a nation state. And I also think about um, the, U the USA as a plural country, but I can understand like some contradictions of our war. And here comes my question. Why if this plurality exists in the United States? Are there also policies and politicians who seek to eradicate like this plurality? You know, for me, it's kind of complicated to understand it. Maybe it's a hard question. And I know, I know that we are not going to solve it in just a minute, but what can you say about that? Because well, I was yesterday like struggling think, with it. I think it's a great question. I think part of the plurality of the United States is that there's always gonna be people in the United States who are against the plurality of the United States. And the question is how you address that, right? Do you, do you say- Yeah, right, I mean that. Do you say that those people shouldn't be allowed to speak because they're against the principle of plurality? As I understand Arendt's view on that is, as long as they're speaking, you will let them speak. But as soon as they act, you have to stop it. Um, and and that's, um, that's, of course, uh, uh, that is a liberal element of Arendt's thinking, if you think of liberalism as hearing different viewpoints and perspectivalism. Um, but, uh, but yes, uh, there are definitely people in the United States that, that are against that. And, and as I said earlier, I think that there's a question to the extent that the United States has been a plural country insofar and a non-nationalist country, because I, I think there's certainly been large portions of our history, if not our present, in which, um, you know, the country was largely uh, seen as uh, a white country uh, and, and, and how to address that real fact of lack of plurality deeply embedded in the United States within the constitutional tradition as Arendt understands it of one of plurality and civic Republican protection of minorities is I think one of the challenges of our generation, of our time. Um, so I, I, I find that to be an open question and one of the most pressing questions of our moment. All right. Oh, yes, I think the same. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks, Denny. Uh, we are out of time. We are off for the month of August. I hope you all have an amazing uh, month amidst the heat around the planet. Um, uh, we come back in September and we begin reading a new book, The Jewish Writings, which is a book that uh, is edited by Jerry and also um, Ron Feldman. And I'm hoping that both Jerry and Ron will, will participate in some of these sessions again and, 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 and give us some of their insights. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. There's some great essays in it and, and other material. 
very much looking forward to reading that with you. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Uh, do join on the membership drive if you haven't yet. And we'll see you all in August. Thanks very much. I mean, in September. Thanks very much. Bye, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Have a great summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great summer, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Have a great summer. Bye-bye.